Buenos días. Uh, thank you. Thank you all of you for coming. I first would like to express my warm thanks to my colleagues, to Casa, <coughs> Casa Aradia, Olivia Orozco, and Karim Hausa Ascaren for allowing me to be here, for giving me for giving us the opportunity to share with you some ideas about the decolonization of colonial knowledge, of anthropological knowledge in Morocco. I would like also to thank Professor Gonzalo Fernandez Peria for being with us for this kind presentation. I understood, let's say, 20%, which is good which is very good. Uh, I would like also to thank my colleague, Professor Irene, for this wonderful meeting with your students. As you said, it was a good warm-up for, for, for the lecture. So historically, anthropology is inseparable from the colonial context. You may have heard some expressions such as anthropologia, anthropology served as a handmade maiden of colonialism, anthropology is a sequel of imperialism, and so on. This is a fact. The Genesis anthropology was linked to imperialism and to colonialism. Anthropology was helpful and useful for colonial power. A useful science, its function is to deliver, to deliver information, intelligence, recognition of the country, and on the basis of these ideas, they advise the colonial power. It can take many forms, reports, secret reports, published articles, published books, but it doesn't mean that all the anthropologists were in the employ or in the service of colonial power. Many of, many of them did, and they provide a colonial power with an ideology that it is legitimized, that justify the colonization. Anthropology provides a vocabulary, provides power with a vocabulary, a set of concepts and ideas that guide the colonial power, or at least it was assumed that it guided colonial powers, such as theories of races, theories of civilization, theories about the primitive culture, the archaic culture, the traditional culture, the superiority of Western civilization, the inferiority of colonized people, and so on. So it was this task, this task was provided by anthropologists. In Morocco, French anthropologists and Spanish anthropologists that you guess I understood just 20% of the Spanish, so I didn't work on, 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 on Spanish, on, on Spanish protectorate, even if there are many articles that are translated into English, but as an anthropologist, I should smell and should touch the language. I cannot, cannot, I cannot uh, work on mediated, mediated sources. So this, this is, let's say a common scientific knowledge for you. 
there is no new about linking colonialism to anthropology. There is no, I guess, no new also about linking colonialism to positivism perspective. I would like to stress on this political, not only political background, but also the intellectual and philosophical background, which is the positivism perspective. The confidence in the success of positivism in social sciences. Positivism and positivism and perspective, positivism perspective, encourage colonialism and anthropology in particular to base the colonization on science. This is the first time where a colonization will recurs to, 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 to science, to social science. A colonial, a colonial, the, the colonial power, according to this positivist perspective, should know something about the country to be colonized or the colonized country. A colonial power should know something about the culture, about the law, about the history, about the geography, and so on, before colonizing or managing it, its, its colonization. So this is a practical knowledge, okay? And I will give you just two instances of this. Oh, this is just, you know, two words or three words about positivism. The positivism is... is to, to the positivist perspective, there are some postulates I share with you with very, very... Oh, oh, sorry. I shared, I shared with you very, very briefly. Well, I can, I can use also. Why? No. We don't complicate. So, so th th this is the postulates I will share with you briefly the, of uh, positivism. The science is the highest form of knowledge, and there is a postulate. Compared to religion, compared to philosophy, the science is the highest form. There are many metaphors, but. Methodological monism, it means that we, within this, it's nicer, within this perspective, theoretical pers perspective, we should apply the same methods of natural sciences to social fact, to cultural fact. Okay? And then the primacy of observation over speculation, August Comte, John Locke, uh, uh, David Hume, and others the description of empirical facts, and so on. It's in red. Positivism has promoted the idea of colonization based on science. That's very important to us. It's that anthropology is a science, is a social science, and as I said, it is the, uh, as, uh, as I said, it is a tool, okay, in the hands of political power. The others, it's not very, very interesting, I should. Okay, so these are the first instance. It's very hard to read from, well, I will. Example one, in 91, okay. In, 90, in, in 91, a delegation of colonial administrators, members of the British Parliament and scholars, called for the establishment of a teaching center in anthropology for the benefit of colonial officials and traders. Just pay attention to the arguments. What are the arguments of, of, of these actors? They are political and they are academics. Okay? The need for this might be illustrated by the case of an official and trained in anthropology whose action led to a misunderstanding on the part of a border tribe. A military expedition followed, military expedition followed, the cost of which was probably 10 times as the Institute asked for in the next 100 years. You, you can use this kind of arguments in your, 
in your call of papers, in your projects, just try to, 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 to put some arguments on. So here you have the argument you should, if you should would be, if, if the colonizer, if the officer want to avoid misunderstanding, he should advise or he should take advice from the trained, the anthropologist or scholars trained in, in, in anthropology. This is, it has nothing to do with Morocco, but in purpose, just to tell you that it's broader, broader than that. The second is close to Morocco, but still it happened in Algeria, in Oran. Colonial experimentation does, I translated from, from, from French, so. Colonial experimentation does led us to apply the doctrines formulated by the successors of Auguste Comte. This is a direct reference to a positivist French, one of the founders of positivism in France, for whom sociology is to politics what biology is to medicine. Let us be inspired by the positivist spirit, spirit if we want to do practical work there. So there is nothing new. They, they were aware of the functions, of the political function of anthropology. This is a science that should be helpful to the colonial, to the colonial power. So now we are more interested not in, in, in colonial period per se, but in two major processes, the decolonization of Morocco and other countries, and more important for the history of anthropology is the arrival in the scene of local academics, anthropologists at home, indigenous anthropologists, whatever you can, you, you, you name it. This is very important for understanding the decolonization of anthropology. We should wait for the formation of Moroccan intellectuals trained in social sciences, not in anthropology, but in history or in geography or in linguistics, okay, to be able to decolonize. First Moroccan intellectuals were how to say, were involved in politics. Okay, it's during the protectorate they were involved. Now, after the, the decolonization of the country, the political decolonization, the task for scholars is another type of decolonization, the decolonization of history, of Moroccan culture, and so on and so on. So this is very important in, 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 in the history of, of, of anthropology. For the first time, local or anthropologists at home will react to a colonial legacy, to anthropological legacy. This happened in the 60s in Morocco, but maybe in India, in North Africa, and in other, in, in, in other, in other, in other countries. So the question is, here we are free, formally or not, this is another question, politically we are free, what to do with this legacy? What to do with the colonial legacy? And to not complicate the, the picture, I I divided my my presentation in two parts. It's Cartesian, two two. But I didn't mean it, but when it comes, I should not refuse it. <laughs> so I'm not integrist. Intellectual integrist. So this is Cartesian. You have one, two, two, two. Yes, this is. So the idea of decolonization. So Olivia, I suggest to you and Conservi, I should suggest to you to, to go there. No. I, I, this is a suggestion. This is not because you are. Okay. So two parts. The idea of decolonization. Okay, and, and I, I choose only two orientations, two theoretical orientations. The first one, 
unveiling ide ideological deformation and the good use of colonial ethnography. I, I will explain this later on. Then in the second part, I will be a bit selfish, a bit egoistic, 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 whatever, egoistic. So I will talk about an alternative, my alternative approach of the study of colonial legacy, and I will focus on ethnographic situation and only on two positions, or on two dimensions, positionality and theoretical orientation. This is for my presentation, really a, a simple, the, how to say, the least I can, I, I, I can do in this, in this presentation. So let's start with, with, with unveiling. Be, be, before, before that, I should, I should, I, I should note before, be, before, before going on, on my presentation, that I try in my presentation and in my writings, and this is a key principle for you because it's about only key principles, theoretical key principles. It's not about information. Uh, information is, it takes time to, to, to present it. So in my presentations, in my publications, I try to reach a level of abstraction that make me or that help me to compare my experience to other experiences. So I go beyond my disciplines, I go beyond my traditional, my uh, theoretical traditions to have this level of, of, of comparisons. I would be very unhappy if my talk only interested students and colleagues working on the same topic. So it's not. So there is a level of abstractions I will, from time to time, to tell you what is this principle, but it will be boring to tell, tell it to you all the time. So unveiling ideological deformation, this is a strategy, you can call it a strategy if you want. Decolonizing the anthropological knowledge means demasking, unveiling its prejudices, to examine its ideological deformation that distort the history and the culture of the colonized people. This is a program for many scholars of Morocco, uh, in, in Morocco, Abdullah uh, Al-Arwi, Abdelkbir Khatibi, German Ayash. Here also I, will, I want to bother you with, 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 with many names. So in order to build uh, decolonized knowledge, many scholars, especially uh, trained in history and sociology, wanted to examine to, watch, to which extent colonial anthropologists have participated or participated to the mystification, it's not my words, it's the actor's words, to the mystification of Moroccan culture, Moroccan society, Moroccan history, okay? So the strategy is to highlight the colonial postulates. There are many colonial postulates. I will focus only on the main postulates or the grape of postulates that were studied by, by Moroccan, Moroccan scholars. The common point of this coronary postulates is reducing Moroccan history, Moroccan society, to structural divisions and cultural oppositions. The objective is that Morocco, or the history of Morocco, is not a history of United country, united nation also, but it's just a mosaic of tribes, mosaic of ethnic, a mosaic of ethnic, ethnic, ethnic groups, a mosaic of 
political communities that were not controlled by the central government and so on. So I give you just a few examples of this opposition. Tribes versus central government. I won't use local, uh, local words. So this is just the concept, central uh, tribes and central government. Berbers versus Arabs. Paganism versus Islam. Customary law versus Islamic law. Nomads versus settled, settled communities or sedentary communities. And the list is very long. So for Moroccan scholars, decolonize the anthropology is to highlight this kind of mystification of deformation of distortion that highlight only the structural divisions of the country. The, the, this is to the colonial power, okay, legitimate colonization, Morocco need unity, Morocco needed reform, political reform, economic reform, infrastructure, etc. etc. I will take only two dimensions, Islamic law and Islam and Arabs versus Berbers, Paganism and customary law. It's, it's a big <laughs> overlap. So to, to this scholar, why French colonial anthropologists focus on paganism, focus on Berbers, focus on customary law. Studying Berber religion or Berber rituals and concluding that Berbers or the Islam of Berbers is loose or the process of Islamization was incomplete or is incomplete is, according to these scholars, to justify the assimilation of Berber or even the Christi Christi Christianization of Berbers. So Islam versus paganism, some quotes to Abdel Kabir Khatibi, short-circuiting the heavy influence of Islam, translated the dream of the assimilation of Berber population. This is his conclusion. To Abdullah al arawi the colonial knowledge aimed at dividing the Moroccan people using the political principle of divide to rule nourished the colonial knowledge. To Germa Ayash, the central government did not just collect taxes, it performed other social and political functions, including the arbitration on tribal conflicts. There is also many ethnographies on the central government that portrayed the central government and local chiefs as parasitic power, as brutal power. The only functions they have is to collect taxes. For Moroccan scholars, there are other functions of social functions and political functions of the central government, in addition of collecting taxes, which is central to any, any, any state. The, the, the arbitration, but also the aid that gave the Mahzen to the tribes in the period of crisis, of drought, and so on. So this is briefly the first strategy where if to decolonize the colonial knowledge is just to explicit its postulates. What are its postulates? And when these postulates are examined, are explicit to show to what extent they were useful for the colonial for the colonial power. 
so we can I, I, I really I will I, I, I will say it with many reserves colonial to this corners colonial knowledge is bad to, to say it very 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 very, very simply the second strategy is more nuanced. It's not about absolute falsity. It's not about absolute truth. There is something, or there is a partial truth within colonial ethnography. As an American star uh, and uh, uh, American history, uh, historian, American put it, talking about a colonial ethnographer, Michel Biller, he said he was an ugly colonialist, but a good ethnographer. So there is, a di 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 there is here a dilemma. It's not what colonial anthropologists wrote about Morocco is not totally false. And there is a good, there are partial, partial truth. You have, this is, as I said to you, just to, to expand our knowledge, to not be prisoner of Morocco. It has to do with the theory of knowledge, Karl Popper, a philosopher, a great philosopher. A pseudoscience may happen to stumble on the truth. Jurist, Moroccan jurist, is to Tunisian, but it's not a problem. Bad intentions do not necessarily produce bad science. A study oriented by ideological prejudices and unworthy interests can inspire a relevant description. So here we have a nuanced position. There is a partial truth, we can use ethnographies, colonial ethnographies, okay? And we should separando los granos de la paya. As I know. Uh, I would like to, to do everything. It will come in the coming, in the, in the coming, coming years. So this is, this second strategy emphasizes the relativity of truth. There is no absolute truth. There is no absolute falsity. We cannot approach a colonial legacy in terms of falsity or truth. Okay. And separating the grains, I said, so this is separating the grains from, 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 the, from the chef. And I have a quote here to, for an anthropologist, sociologist, Moroccan sociologist. I will read it. We remain convinced that despite the colonial abuses, that Moroccan ethnography and psychology have experienced, they can still be a while ways to recover our dynamic fastidious in order to try to penetrate the, the, in order to penetrate them better. We are convinced that to print a discipline like ethnography, a new life, we have to take history, mistakes and even abuses in order to correct them. So, to separate the grains from, from, from the chef, I don't have, until now I don't have examples, clear examples to how we can separate the grains from the chef. So, it's a strategy, it's a program, but to my knowledge, um, maybe I'm, I'm I'm not right, to my knowledge, there is no strategy, as I said, for the first orientation, the method, the approach is clear, identify the postulate and show to which extent this postulate were useful to the power. It's clear, but within this strategy, it's just, you know, an expression of faith, if, if you want. There is no, uh, until, Till now. Okay. Now this is, this was the, if you say, if, if you want, the content of this orientation, slight critics to these orientations. The first one 
is their positivist orientation to positivism knowledge is conceived as the reflection in the mind of the, ob the uh, as the reflection of the reality in the mind of the observer this has nothing to do with colonialism this has to, to do with the positivist paradigm the positivist perspective this is their uh, conception of the relation between the observer and the reality okay so i will repeat it conceived Knowledge is conceived as the mirror, as the reflection of reality in the mind of, 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 uh, of the observer, who, the, the observer, if he is not blinded by his prejudices, can reach the reality and describe it as it is. We talked about objectivity earlier. This is one of the conceptions of, of, of objectivity according to positivism. So, here, even if Moroccan scholars criticize colonial anthropologists who based their knowledge on positivist, positivist science, here also Moroccan scholars use a positivist postulate because it, it suffices to remove the prejudices to get or to reach the Moroccan reality. Okay? So this is a critic within the methodological perspective. The second one is that nationalists were highlighting only the cleavages affecting the unity of the country. And I'm an anthropologist, I read a lot about Moroccan anthropology, colonial anthropology. It's not always the same. There is a kind of, as you know, in ideological, the ideologization of something is always selective. Okay? I want to show something and I will select examples that, you know, that, that, that defend my, my, my postulate. So, highlighting the cleavages of affecting the unity of the country and discarding many colonial knowledge that stress on the unity of Morocco, of the unity of, 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 of Moroccan people. Le, some, some of them, some of them at the beginning of the, the, the colonization, talked about the Moroccan mentality, the Moroccan soul, etc. So it's not only about division, it's not only about structural division. There are, so what to do? Why you exclude this colonial knowledge that stress the unity of Morocco? Why choosing only one kind of, of colonial anthropology? This is a critic, and this is also, you have a prejudice, you, you want to show that colonial knowledge was dividing Moroccan people, you will choose this colonial knowledge or these authors that suit and that fit with, 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 with your postulate. But if you are a scholar, as I try to, to do, to have a broad view of the colonial knowledge, and in my book on Le Proche de Lointain, there is a chapter on Moroccan, 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 Moroccan mentality, Moroccan character, etc., etc. So, this is, as I said, brief critics to, 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 my, to my colleagues to, to be back to, to the social position. My social position, because I didn't experience colonial period. Okay? Moroccan scholars like Khatibi, Larwi, uh, were born in the 1930s. They experienced colonial power. I didn't experience power. I didn't leave this experience post-independence, etc. So maybe it makes me it, 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 it makes me different, very different, of my position 
is very different than, than, than theirs. All good so far? It's eight, I know. Okay. So, this is the, the second part. Uh, the, the, the second part I will uh, I will just present how I dealt with with with, with colonial anthropology, and I will stress on the concept of ethnographic situation I shared with you or with the student of uh, with uh, Irene Cortez students I shared with them a paper on ethnographic situation, but I will just focus on the reduction of colonial ethnography to its ideological dimension. When we talk about decolonization, we took just one dimension, and with ethnographic, with the concept of the ethnographic situation, I expand the, my study to other dimensions, theoretical, and I will explain why, and also sociological, sociological and I will take only the example of social position. No graphic counter, I will discard it for the moment. We won't have time to go further. So, The social position, the, the, the first critic is that the category of the colonial anthropologist is a vague social position. It is very hard to examine legal, le, the colonial legacy within these vague positions just because there are many, many different social positions. We cannot put in the same basket of colonial knowledge the traveler, the explorer, the missionary, the uh, research resident, the academic scholar, and so on. So, as they have, there are many social positions. The question is, how do social positions affect, impact colonial legacy? This is a link, a sociological link. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, my inspiration is not anthropology. Here is the sociology of knowledge, okay? So, two examples, two short examples, two brief examples. Edmond Douté, a colonial anthropologist, French anthropologist who lived in Algeria, made short trips in Morocco between 91 and 90 and 96. He's well known. He has three or four books. He called his trips mission. It's not a field work, it's mission, mission. He was in hurry. He did his journey from Casablanca to Marrakesh lasted six six days. And the book is 200 pages, more than 200 pages. He had ephemeral interactions with Moroccan people, no interviews. Just to recall you that the technique of inter interview, the interview which may seem technical, uh, anthropologists didn't use it when the interaction with people was for them secondary. So the result is a loose ethnography, very loose ethnography. Compared to other ethnographers, like Jacques Berck, who lived in Morocco during more than 20 years, 
Robert Montan, also more than 15 years, also, I'm, I'm not sure about the date, but they were officials and they lived in Morocco. This has nothing to do with the standard anthropologist who came for two years and, and, and go back to, 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 to his country. So th there are people that, th there are scholars that they are in touch with the population in the daily basis. Okay? So two social positions, a traveler, okay, and the scholar resident, the official. Jacques Berg was a, was a chief of, uh, of uh, how to say, uh, how to translate it, chief of uh, indigenous affairs. And it, he stayed in, within the Berber in the High Atlas, the structure social, which is well known, six years. So when we talk about, I can give many examples, and I, I give many examples in my book, Le Prochet Le Lointain, I give many examples to, that, that showed how the positions of anthropologists shape, impact, influence his knowledge or his ethnography. The second thing is that Colonial anthropologists, such as, as I said, Jacques Berck, Robert Montagne, and others, were double-hatted. Double-hatted. They have more than one hat. They have two hats: the hats of the colonial officer, but également, but également, but also the, but also the, the hat of, of the, the hat of, uh, of, uh, of academic scholar. Dute was in contact with Marcel Mauss, was in contact with the journal founded by Emile Durkheim, L'année Sociologique. His book on magic and religion in North Africa was presented as an academic book. The same can be said of Robert Montan, his book Les Berbères et le Marzen was his doctorate thesis defendant in La Sorbonne. So this is another aspect of the position, of the social position. We should take into consideration the two aspects. Yes, he has colonial interests, but he also seek, or he was seeking also, the recognition of his peers, Marcel Mauss. I should be recognized by Marcel Mauss, by Lani Sociologique, by La Sorbonne, and so on. So it's academic, it's colonial, and it's, 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 also, it's also academic. So we should, we should take into consideration this. I call it dual-hatted. They were dual-hatted. I don't know if, if it's correct or not, but no problem. They, were, they have two hats. I have a paper on La Metaphore de Casquette. And, with about my hats, the hat of the intellectual, the scholar, the consultant, all these hats. Okay. So, and for this reason, that they have academic interests, that's the theoretical orientations, their theoretical orientations is very important. They don't use, they, don't, they use theoretical conceptions. Edmond Dutte referred to James Fraser, to Robert Taylor, he used concepts related to the evolutionism, to the evolutionary theory, the concept of the origin and of the survivals and so on. So they are not only producing a colonial knowledge on Morocco, but to them they are producing theoretical knowledge and they are referring to theories of evolutionary, of, uh, 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 to evolutionism, sorry. George Hardy and, and, and Louis, Brino, Louis Brino, I told the, uh, I, I didn't mention their name earlier, but they were working on the soul of Morocco, on the mentality of Morocco, on the spirit of Morocco, Moroccan culture, etc., etc. 
those criticized Edmond Dutte and criticized James Fraser within the same colonial legacy. You have theoretical tensions, theoretical conflicts between the scholars. They are not nourished, all nourished from the same spoon, as he said in English. So if they are not nourished from the same spoon, we should take this into consideration. They were referring, those who work on the national character, on the Moroccan character, etc., they were referring to collective psychology, not to evolutionism. And there is at least two, 20 years between the production of, 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 of Dutte and the books and the papers of George Hardy and Dewey Brino. So this positionality means, I also, I did, theoretical orientations, sorry, so colonial interest in, are interested in academic in academic theories, and that that's why that's why in this complex concept of of of, of ethnographic ethnographic situation, we should take a dimension. It's not only about ideology. It's not only about ideological dimension, it's also about this academic dimension. Now, the question or the issue is no less, menos, menos, menos than second minutes, menos, no. Um, this is, I know, also, estoy cansado. I'm tired. Uh, no, by reducing, this is my conclusion in two minutes. By reducing colonial anthropology to its dimension, uh, ideological dimension, we lose sight of its theoretical dimension, especially its articulation, the, the articulation between these two dimensions. Now, how, because I, I, I'm not as, as, as it's not as, as uh, cut, as I presented, the question is how this theoretical evolution, the, the evolutionism, uh, excuse me, how the evolutionism, how the psychology, collective psychology, how the legacy, even if it's academic, how it turns, it becomes ideology. It's not separated, it's not two separated dimensions, but there is, they, are, they are overlapped, and one of my project is to describe how colonial ideology, as an academic, as an academic knowledge, turns into ideology. It's the same for economics, it's the same for the development, for the science of the development, it's the same for the climate change, it's the same, it's the same. So you have a scientific knowledge, and at one time, within social and political processes, became an ideology. Thank you for your patience. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan. And now, if you agree, we can have a bit of time for a Q&A from the people here in the room. Let's uh, collect some questions. If you have a question, you can just raise your hand and we will hand you a microphone. Gonzalo might have some comments or questions himself to get things rolling. Actually, no, there's a question from the middle of the room. Please wait for a microphone. And in the meantime, I'm going to give the speaker his headphones. Yes, hello. Good afternoon. I think at the beginning you mentioned 
You mentioned at the beginning that colonialism, specifically in Morocco, that one of the reasons was that it, it was science-based, I think you said, or uh, and I wonder what kind of examples, what kind of science-based examples they use to justify colonialism in Morocco. I'm sorry, I changed the color. Oh, ah. <laughs> would you repeat? See. Si. Um, yes, hello, this is the English Channel. You want to just check, this is the English Channel, this is the English Channel. Can you hear us? Yeah? Okay, good. I was saying that you, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk something about how colonialism used scientific arguments to justify itself, to justify the occupation of Morocco, for instance. And so I was wondering if you could give us some examples of those scientific principles that they used as an excuse or as a justification. I will be very brief. It's the postulates that were criticized by Moroccan scholars. The structural divisions of Morocco between the tribal tribes and central government, the divisions between Arabs and Muslim, between Islamic law and Isla customary law, and so on and so on. So th these are the ju scientific ju ju justification that some of them, the, 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 there are many, but if you, if you read the, one of the oldest ethnography on Morocco, it, it was in 1884, and it, it was the justification, and it's, it's uh, Charles de Foucault, Charles de Foucault, Reconnaissance du Maroc. And he gives the justification in 1984. It's at least three decades before the official colonization of Morocco. And one of these, of these, of these, uh, of these, uh, of these, uh, of these uh, arguments is the corruption of the tribal chiefs, is the division of Morocco between what they call the autonomous tribes and the tribes that they pay taxes. It's a, one of the most structural division on which the colonization high, uh, on which the, 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 the colonization stress. There are many, but I, I, I give, I, I guess I, I, I give some of these structural divisions. <laughs> There are many, many books on the Mahzen, on the central government that needed reform, but it will take time. It will take time. But I think it's, it, it's sufficient. The, 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 the postulates are, are sufficient to, to give some... I have another question in the room. There's another question here in the room. Spanish. Okay. English. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, the first thing it came to my mind when I saw the topic, it's the emic and ethic perspective of Marvin Harris. Um, well, um, Harris thought there is one emic perspective for each ethic perspective. But as I see it, you see several ethnic perspectives for the same ethic perspective. The ethic will be the colonial perspective, and the ethnic will be the all of the. So, um, uh, for Harris, the, the the reality, the truth, it's in a middle point between the ethnic and ethic. But if we have here several ethnic perspectives, we should find for each emic, uh, the middle point with the ethic, or there's a, I don't know, um, common point of view. Okay. Uh, good question. 
I still have some force. Is it okay? No problem. So, yeah, I, I said that if, 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 if we take into consideration the history of anthropology, uh, and at what time the issue of the actor's point of view, the indigenous point of view, became important to an anthropologist. Edmond Dutte, who I mentioned, and who made these missions in Morocco, the answer is, they have nothing to tell me. I have nothing to learn from Moroccans. This is what I observe, I can observe it directly, externally, and the interpretation I give to these rituals, I will pick it up, pick it up from comparative ethnography. Okay, so in all his books, he has two or three interviews with. At the same time, at the same time, within the same perspective, theoretical perspective, evolutionary perspective, Westermark, Edward Westermark, a Finnish, a Finnish anthropologist, a mentor of Marinovsky, professor of Marinovsky, did field works, and he said that the information should come from the mouth of Moroccans. Now, you said the middle, I would like to, to have milk, milk cafe or cafe milk, something like that. But it doesn't work like this. It doesn't work like this. It doesn't work f for, now you have two, two, two strategies. The first strategy is neglecting the actor's point of view. The second interpretative, you call it interpretative anthropology, symbolic anthropology, Weberian sociology, whatever. That the actor's point of view is very important, but there are two types or two kinds of, 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 of concepts. Concepts, as Clifford Gates mentioned them, distant concept from experience, okay? And the other distant and close from experience. I don't have examples from, from here, but from, from, from Spanish, but to, the fear is a concept that is close to the experience. Phobia, paranoia, etc., is concepts that are distant. How we can manage this? It's a chemistry. No one can tell you how to do. No one. You can just follow Levi Strauss if you want. You can just follow Gertz if you want. You can just follow Victor Turner, working on the exegesis of, of, of rituals, etc. But there is no something which is middle or outside or, or, or etc. I did it. For, for rituals, this is your starting point. The, 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 this is the, 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 the minimum. Your starting point your, is the vocabulary of people you are studying. Without this vocabulary, you cannot reach the meaning of the ritual. Okay, expressions, formalization, etc. But it's a hard question. Now, sometimes, but I, I, I can do it sometimes. I should reformulate the question, but it's your question. I don't have right to reformulate it. Sometimes the problem is in the question, not in the answer. And sometimes the, your question is very terrible to answer. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Pregunta, no, eh, sí. No había una más para ahí, bueno, pues se quedan entonces. I think there was a question here in the front of the room. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just I have two points. My first point is what I understood from your um, your presentation, and please correct me if I, if I misunderstood um, that um, the anthropo anthropologists were very complicit in em enabling colonialism by providing information and insight into local cultures and local dynamics, and thus enabling the colonialists to exploit these these um, these issues. So, from my point of view, um, I wouldn't. I would, well, as I said, I would um, define anthropologists as complicit and not at fault because, sure, they went there with certain assumptions and they were most certainly financed by actors who profited from colonialism, but what they did was trying to understand local dynamics and they did so quite successfully, otherwise colonialism would never have worked the way it did. So they produced knowledge and this knowledge was, was misused. Maybe you can elaborate on that, right, what your perspective would be on that, and maybe I would also like to come to my second point, look a bit in the future what anthropologists can actually do to remedy um, their their mistakes in the past or they, their enablement of colonialism because I think in, in today's world and in, in globalization it is more, more importantly than ever to not just you know talk about people but understand their dynamics. So um, I think intercultural competence in, in politics and diplomacy but also in economic relations is, is essential be in being successful. What I want to know is how can anthropologists from your point of view facilitate this cooperation, but where do they also need to be cautious? Because just as in the past, I also see the potential today that anthropologists and the knowledge they produce can either be exploited to use cleavages to exploit people and societies, but on the other side, it can also benefit cooperation and just facilitate it. I don't need to correct you. I don't need to correct you. It's okay. So, no, no, it's okay. The, the complicity, and you, you give me the chance just to, to elaborate more on, on what, what, what is the content of the complicity. There are at least two, two I, I will begin by two situations, and if, if other situations come to, to my mind, I will, I will add them. The first one is, I am the general resident Liotte, okay, the head of the colonial administration, and I will call Robert Montan, Laos, George Hardy, and there is a gathering, 1921, what we should do. The political staff is here, the academic staff is here, and they try to cooperate. And to do something about, about, about Moroccan culture, Moroccan society. This is one thing. Anthropology is in the service of, institutionally, is in the service. I'm asking you to help me. The, 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 the broken, the Berbers, the Berber, the Mahzen, the Mahzen and the Berbers was a sort of comment from Lyoté to Robert Montan. Tell us what, what happens in this in this tribe. What, has, what are the structures? What are their social morphology? What, what, how you can explain the genesis of personal power? We know that it, the, these republics are democratic. There are only council, tribal councils, village councils. How this? How do you explain the genesis of, of these lords of, of the Atlas? He did it. Now. The other side of, of, of the question is what the, what the colonial power did with these books, with these conclusions. It's a hard. I, I have some some clues, but I, I don't have the, the whole the, the whole picture. Robert Montan, you know, he loved the Berber Republic. He, he was a romantic a republic, a romantic republic. And so. He didn't like authoritarian uh, local uh, chiefs, etc. But, but at the same time, he said, you know, tribal council for rational administration, bureaucratic administration, you know, the member of the tribal council, when they came to the office of an administrator, 
they don't negotiate with him. They just take the proposition and they should go back to the tribal council to discuss and return back to, etc. It will take time with these republics. So it, it doesn't fit with, with the rational administration, bureaucratic administration. Even if I prefer republic, colonial protectorate should work with these lords. Even if they are authoritarian, even if they are brutal, if, even if they exploit people, etc. So you have the theoretical conclusion and you have the pragmatical solution. And they don't fit. The other thing, I begin by, 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 by this cartoon, if we can. The first cartoon, please. If you can read, uh, no, no, you cannot read. So, the, the other thing is, like many intellectuals do, actually, they take the initiative to advise the power, whatever the power is. I'm here, I'm intellectual, I will tell you what to do with economics, with politics, with Islamism, with whatever. And Edmond Dutte was one of them. He was not invited to give advice, but he still gives advice. And what is his advice? I talked about collect, uh, tribal chiefs. I said, they said, I'm an anthropologist. I know that this is ephemeral and he's right, because you know, the, 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 there are many, many, many tribal chiefs that their authority or their power lasted, uh, I don't know, one decade, two decades, three decades, and they are they are killed by, by other either chiefs. But religious lodges, Zawiya, those are, you know, structural institutions. So colonialism should rely on these lodges and not on political institutions, not on tribal chiefs. What the colonial protocol did, the middle, milk, cafe milk, they work with, with both, but more with the tribal chief than with lodges. So I, I, I remember the, I, I remember the, an assessment of, of, of uh, oh, even Spreachers, who was a military officer, a well-known anthropologist, British anthropologist, he was a military officer in Sudan and in other countries. He said that we advise them, they never take, they never take our advice. So it's, you know, it's like, like, like now, the, the, the bureaucratic power has its interests, has its logic, has its knowledge. Maybe for, from time to time he, ca he can seek some, some, some justification, but it's not, the complicity is not simple as that. It's not that, give me an advice, I will follow you. And it's not that. So that's decolonizing anthropology, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a complex, it's a complex, complex issue. But it's not my fault, the, 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 the yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, the, the ask, uh, the, the, the ask, uh, Accurate questions, so I cannot uh, answer by yes or no. We have a question from the online uh, uh, yes. chat. Yes. It's from Professor Rafael Bustos Garcia de Castro, which is a professor at the Master of Political, uh, Political International in the Complutense, which is also collaborating in this session. So he's saying, for sure, um, not all the anthropology colonial anthropology is disposable. We cannot put all in the, in the bin, no? But what is, in your opinion, um, uh, what is more uh, valuable for the colonial anthropology produced in Algeria and Morocco? So what would you take from the colonial anthropology produced in Morocco and Algeria? What would you take it as valuable? I don't know. <laughs> Really, it's not my concern. 
I have nothing to take. I really have, if, if, I was in, if, if I was responsible for a museum, I will take the ethnography of the tent, of the habitation, of the jewelry. I will take it. So it's, 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 it's not an abstract question. It's, it depends on your social position. My social, as a scholar, I have nothing to take. If uh, you, you, are, you, you, you are organizing an exhibition on, on Moroccan craft, you have a good description of the, uh, of the confections of crafts with all the rituals which recalls the death and, the, and, the, and, the, and other notions. So, and even what, what I try to do, because when you say decolonize, when you say there are some granos we can take, huh, some granos mm -hmm. we can take, that means that it's, it, it's a kind of bazaar and the, nothing is overlapped. As a scholar, there is nothing to take, but much more to learn from, from them. Much more to learn than I did. Much more to learn about them before the Moroccan culture. Sometimes you, you, you know about the scholars more than the people studied. So now, like this, I'm sorry, I, I, I have not, nothing to, 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 to take. Nothing. If he if, if has an example, we can, we can, we can help him with, with, with examples. Gonzalo, tenías una pregunta. Gonzalo, you had a question? Check for this uh, wonderful talk on how colonial knowledge was fleshed out through a discipline that was key, crucial to, to the colonial project. Uh, because, I mean, I think it served to, to prove or to, to expand the idea that the colonizers were superior to, to the colonized people. And uh, I would like to, to take something that you mentioned related to the fragmentation of Moroccan society from this anthropological perspective and introducing a new aspect related to what I mentioned in the presentation, that's the, the colonized part of Morocco that was under the Spanish protectorate. So that will be another fragmentation aspect to this uh, post-colonial Morocco. Um, and uh, also, uh, I would like to comment you something on an idea that was very very dear to Spanish uh, anthropology, to Spanish colonial anthropology that you probably know, but since we have many international students, I think it's also interesting. It's the idea that uh, the Spanish colonialism was different to French colonialism because of many reasons, some of them related to the existence of Al-Andalus or the ideas related to the existence of this geographic proximity and the idea of a, a blood ties between the old peoples in North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. So the Spanish colonial discourse and Spanish anthropology in the colonial times developed the idea of brotherhood. I mean, Spanish, Spaniards and Moroccans were brothers. I mean, they were almost the same, but quite the same, but not exactly. So how would you deal with, with this an idea in your project of uh, decolonizing the anthropological thought? No, on, 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 this, on, this, on, on this idea of the brotherhood, I didn't know. I'm sorry? I didn't know. Really, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. I didn't know that they, they used it. So, brotherhood in Spanish, herma. How do you tell it in Spanish? Herma. Hermanda. 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 I know hermanos, hermana, but. Hermanda. Okay, hermanda. I, I didn't know. So, so. I'm learning now. Okay, brotherhood, hermanda. I will check for it. I didn't know. Really.
So this was one of the key ideas of... Uh, <laughs> now, just to, 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 to react directly to, to, to that is the, 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 the history, the, 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 the history of, 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 of colonialism, the inventions of words, it may be brotherhood, it may be the savage, the noble savage, it may be... Uh, that means that you cannot, at least if you use your example, you cannot specify a common, strategic, a common strategy to colonialism. It depends on the context. Mm -hmm. How many contexts you, may, you might have that will, will look like Andalusia with the North Africa? How, how many? I don't, I don't know. If you can have this kind of context. So they take advantage of the context, of the proximity. We are not colonizer. Huh? You were here and you were our, our brothers. Now you are there and you are we are still your brothers. That's good. I, I, really, I, I'm shameful for that because, as I said, uh, I, don't, I don't speak Spanish. Now with people, I, we can cheat. I'm, but. I don't like cheating. <laughs> I, sh I, sh I should check. I should check the translation. Uh, I, 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 I can't use deep or, 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 or. Mm -hmm. so. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm starting to, to 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 learn Spanish. Maybe not for academic reasons, but who knows? Who knows? I can advance you that, despite this idea that you said it's just a word. I mean, in the surface, there was brotherhood. In the deep, in the deep, deeper uh, than that, deeper than that, yeah, it was colonialism. I can say just, that. Yeah, yeah, I can say. Like, you, you know, uh, you, you know, in there is there, there, there is there, there is a saying in Morocco: when you want to eat a plant, you name it. You give it a name. So, giving a name of things, it's it's not always it's not always a sign of kindness. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I noticed. I, I noted this. Uh, Hermanda. I will see. Tenemos unos minutitos más. Si alguna otra pregunta, si no. We have a couple more minutes. If there are any other questions, if not, we'll wrap up. I don't think there were any other questions online. No. <laughs> She, she started in, in the beginning quoting Leila Slimani yeah. that I had in mind also to mention this idea of uh, decolonizing takes time yeah. decolonizing minds and bodies mm. and since we are also with young people that yeah. they are more than we are maybe because of uh, a generation uh, issue in, in, term, in issues related to, to gender uh, uh, this introducing the, the body and not, not only the mind uh, I mean has been anthropology has been the nationalist uh, uh, efforts and the, the colonizing efforts such a masculine uh, uh, endeavor that maybe it will be good to, to have another voices coming into the field yeah I agree <laughs> yeah why not and that will change our perspective on, on the bodies, for instance, the colonial bodies or the colonizing. You know, the, I have a collection of, 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 of pictures. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. It's, 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 it, you know, it's, it, it, it needs another skills. You know, reading a picture, it's not like, like reading a ritual, like reading a sacrifice. It's not a, and I can't have all the skills. But yeah, it's a, it's a path. It's a path and it's a good path. Okay, so with this idea of new voices to decolonize anthropology uh, for the new generations, We'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you again, Professor Ashid and Gonzalo and Martin also from the master's program and the interpreters. I always forget to mention them. Thank you very much for your work.
and just to remind you of a couple of things, uh, continuing with Morocco this Friday, we'll be screening uh, the film Return to Hansala, and you're invited to come and see that. And after the screening, there will be a debate with the director Chus Gutierrez and Farah Ahmed, who's the main actress. That's to continue with Morocco, although from a different perspective, that of immigration. And also, I'd like to remind you of the next two lectures in Aula Universitaria. Next Tuesday, a lecture on how to bring Arab culture to students of Arab as a second language. And that's next Tuesday, on March 7th, and to celebrate International Women's Day, within the context of Aura Alabe, there will be another lecture on Arab storytellers with Ruben Basili, who is a writer and a lecturer at the American University of Cairo. I hope you'll find that interesting and we'll see you back here very soon. Thank you. Gracias por escucharnos. Si quieres estar al corriente de todas nuestras actividades, consulta nuestra página web en www.casaarabe.es. También puedes seguirnos en nuestros canales en las redes sociales en Instagram, Twitter y Facebook. Gracias.